This episode is brought to you by Communications Training for Coffee Teams, a new Mapper Forward workshop tailored to get your team communicating more confidently to improve general mental health as well as business profitability. Click the link in the show notes for further details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode three of a five part series with the fabulous Judy Gaines. Judy, today we are talking about the global economy and coffee. It We've been talking about an economic tsunami that's coming on this podcast for quite some time now. It seems to be as soon as it starts to edge closer, it seems to put itself further out. Nobody knows if there's going to be a hard landing or a soft landing or or any landing at all. We don't know what's coming. What is the relationship of what the, the tenseness or the tension that exists in the global economy right now and its relationship to coffee? Well, the good news is that coffee consumption tends to not be as sensitive mm-hmm. to the global economy as what the market fears. So right. we had a situation um, last year where you know everyone was worried about the fallout from the war in Ukraine mm-hmm. and heat and oil prices going up and hyperinflation and, and our consumers going to pull back and drink less coffee. And I always tell people, if someone's coffee drinking is habitual and a three cup a day drinker is still going to have their three cups a day. They will shift to that behavior, right? They're not going to change the amount of coffee they're consuming, Mm -hmm. but what they might do is change their behavior in terms of Mm -hmm. where are they purchasing their coffee from? And maybe the appliances that they bought during the pandemic that were, you know, collecting dust on a counter, they're going to say, wait a second, you know, we worked hard and, you know, got these new barista skills and we're going to go back to doing that as Mm -hmm. opposed to shelling out larger bucks at a cafe. So that, that would hurt food service segment where coffee is obviously at a higher price. And if people are looking to, skimp on their budgets, then they go back to having more coffee at home, which actually tends to increase consumption because there's more waste. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's back to the kitchen sink having, you know, a few more cups. Mm -hmm. Because people people are brewing too much at home and they don't drink at all. People serve appliances and pods, Mm -hmm. take some of that away. Mm -hmm. But the market's already reflected that transition and adjustment mm-hmm. for that. Um, you know, but maybe they'll say to someone, oh, would you like a cup? And, you know, or maybe they'll go back and keep making additional cups. And maybe they didn't quite get it right the first time. And, oh, I'm going to make mm-hmm. another cup and try it again. Now, the interesting dynamic is do they count that as part of their consumption? Right. Because most people don't count waste. So they say, you know, there'll be a survey, how many cups of coffee did you drink on average this past week? And they'll say four or three. Mm -hmm. But they're not talking, they they forget about all these little extra cups that they've consumed, Mm -hmm. which maybe they poured one cup and, then they got busy on a call and it got cold and right. they poured it out and made another cup. Or they went out to dinner and they had a cup of coffee that maybe they normally wouldn't have late mm-hmm. in the evening. Or someone got them a cup of coffee. And people forget about all these extra cups of coffee that they're mm-hmm. consuming when they're thinking about what is my average consumption? Well, it's three cups. But when you add all these little forgotten things, it's probably higher. Or, or look at when we go to conferences, right? Mm-hmm. And you have the coffee breaks and you have your coffee in the hotel room. And then you go down to breakfast and you're sitting there talking to people and you have another cup. And then you have the two breaks and the one at lunch and then the one at dinner. Mm. And it all adds up. And maybe you didn't drink all of it, but it's still consumed. So people's habitual behavior isn't going to change of drinking coffee, but the, the, there will be a shift and we're seeing that 
quite clearly. We saw it during the pandemic. We are seeing it as inflation has continued to take hold. It's obviously not transitory. Um, And people's consuming habits are shifting towards other things. We have very tight um, labor markets. Uh, We also have full employment in most countries around the world, most developed countries around the world. So people still have disposable income to spend on coffee at the moment. Well, they have income. How much is disposable right. versus debt and, and other factors and they need to spend it on other things is it, sort of where it gets a little bit cloudy. But So as interest rates go up, and people are having to commit more money to their mortgages because of increased in interest rates or interest cre- increased credit card rates. Um, and other the price of eggs in the US is wild uh, at the moment. So as people are starting to, in- to experience these inflationary pressures, uh, and it's different everywhere around the world. The, you know, Europe is experiencing really high inflation right now compared to the US, which is still high, but nothing compared to what's going on in Europe. Where do you see that people will start to sh- – like when is the shift going to become something that moves the market? I don't think it will. Really? I, really, I mean, I don't see – I mean, my almost four decades of following this market. Yeah. Yeah. The, the shift in demand is so small relative to changes in production. It, it's like a, it's a minor rounding error. I mean, there's a dispute about the size of the Brazilian crop from three years ago by two, three million bags. No one knows exactly what it was. Okay. I mean, you're not talking about that much of a loss in demand. Right. I mean, no one, no one really can pinpoint specifically how much global consumption is to start with. I mean, it's kind of, you look at changes right. in stocks, but stocks, all stocks aren't visible and how is it accounted for? And then there's and the cash market. There's, which... a lot of, there's a lot of guesswork involved. There's mm-hmm. a lot of stocks that, you know, sort of show up when prices are high. Yep. And so to me, it's the production side and expectations on supply that are always going to be the the key driver for the market, more so than than consumption. But that being said, the psychological component Mm -hmm. is important because roasters roasters start to fear that something's going to change. They're, They're going to see some backup in supply. And I'll give you an example Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sort of the trade stopped buying as much coffee from origin from some of the higher price producers. Mm-hmm. And so there was a sense of, oh, business is awful. So this is, you know, right. like November last year. Okay. Mm-hmm. I remember being in Costa Rica and then I was in Colombia and everyone was talking about how terrible demand was. <laughs> and it wasn't that demand was really terrible. It was that people stopped buying that coffee because it was more They're more expensive. price sensitive. More price sensitive, yeah. And and therefore they were feeling it more so than commercial purchases. Yeah. Right. And so you have shifts in the trade flows and people were also reducing inventory. And if you're reducing inventory inventory thinking that demand is going to slow then you're not buy- then the trade is replenishing buying as much mm. and therefore it's the sense of um you know things are weak but they they really aren't necessarily it's just some gaps in the supply chain so that's the economics on the consuming end on the producing end we saw as the war in ukraine was escalating, um, we saw that inputs into coffee producing became a real challenge for producers to be able to secure the supply, first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, and then to be able to afford the the inflation in the pricing. Is that 
economic pressure going to continue into 2023, do you believe? Well, there were some adjustments. So Mm -hmm. um, chicken manure became really popular. Right. And that drove up the the prices because Mm -hmm. fertilizer prices were too high. And I think a real positive that's coming out of it is there's a lot of regenerative agriculture, organics, and that is going to make a big difference. And so, Mm. you know, from, from the negatives come positives and farmers figure out a way to adapt, become more efficient and adapt and at the same time help the environment Mm -hmm. and so to me that's all great and Mm. you know i'm hearing more and more that farmers are looking to do this and they're they're thinking about the soil they're thinking about the future and Mm -hmm. their and their water use and what are they going to do and that that's so important it's really really important You set us up perfectly for the next episode um, where we're going to talk about Robusta because talking about, you know, from the negatives come the positives. Robusta is a really, really great uh, example of the way that a discussion that needs to be had around the way the industry sees Conifera and the necessity is going to play in our industry moving into the future. So let's go have a conversation about that. Peace, love, and peanut butter, everybody. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in, friends. There are two ways you can support this podcast. Firstly, become a paid member of our YouTube channel. Secondly, you can join our Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video before you leave and check the show notes for more information. Now, this is what you should check out next.